Hi, Nikki. Hi, Craig. So we're going to talk about your five questions. We're going to dive into those just a little bit and uh, just have a time of conversation with each other. So the first question is just telling about yourself and your, your journey as a church musician. So how did, how did that happen for you? Gosh, it's so funny. I, I, I tell people sometimes I feel like I tripped and fell into church music. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know it was God, but it, it feels like it was very random at some level. So, so I was the first Christian in my home mm -hmm. at 13. I got saved through Young Life. Wow. Um, and honestly, I don't, I'm not sure how else I would have come to Christ had Young Life not been in my school. Um, and so I was the first Christian in my home. Uh, here's something to like blow your mind and blow your listener's mind is even though my family overall, my immediate family wasn't like Christian practicing Christians, mm -hmm. I had been in a church before really? and not once did anybody ever tell me that I could actually like have a relationship with Christ. Wow. So let that, let that scare you. Mm. Um, so anyway, so I started walking with Jesus at 13 and I mean, I've been a performer, musician my entire life, mm -hmm. a singer. And uh, I never even knew that church music or Jesus music even existed, you know, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I just had no context for it. So when I started walking with the Lord at 13, um, I started going to church with a young life leader friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, oh, wow, like people sing about God. <laughs> well, that's different. You know, I, I didn't even know it existed. I didn't know any hymns, like nothing. Mm -hmm. So to make an extremely long story short, um, started, you know, kind of being involved in church and music while still, you know, doing my kind of music thing outside of the church. And um, gosh, about 20 some years ago, started leading the worship ministry at my church, which is hilarious to me. Um, <laughs> Again, that's why I say I feel like I tripped and fell into it, but um, God knew that it would be one of my passions. And so I'm, I'm happy that he pushed me uh, wow. into a space I didn't really think I would ever want to be in. I, honestly, worship leading looked like the worst job in the world to me. I was like, why would anybody want to do that? It just looked horrible. Um, so that's why I say it's funny when I think that that's been about 20 years of my life. Wow. So just kind of piggybacking off that a little bit. So you, you, you kind of connected with the church and obviously was saved at 13. What was that catch up kind of like for you? Just, you know, never ever growing up being exposed to the church and then now 13. Okay. What, what does that look like for you? Well, you know, I only really have perspective on it now that I look back. Sure. Because I actually think that's part of what, made me successful as a church leader mm -hmm. because I was always thinking about people who didn't go to church. And, right. you know, sometimes in church circles, we always talk about reaching people that don't know God, mm -hmm. but that was a cultural wake up for me. I mean, you know, I mean, think about it for a minute. You know, I, I start going to a church and you think about how we run services now, right? Nobody ever mm -hmm. explains why we're doing what we're right. doing. Right. Right. And mm -hmm. we take a lot for granted that people just get it. And everything was, I mean, I had never read my Bible before, Craig. And wow. so there was a lot of assumptions. So I say all that to say, mm -hmm. thinking back as a new Christian, I mean, thank God for my young life leaders, because I really had to find my way because I had literally no context right. Right. for how to exist and thrive in a new faith community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like for me, you know, I'm a pastor's kid. So I grew up literally next door to the church my entire life, yeah. went to Christian school through eighth grade, you know, wow. so I mean, that was, that was, that was who I was. So it was part of who I, you know, I mean, I was baptized when I was three weeks old. So, you know, it was one of those things where the church was always there. So yeah, for me having that perspective, I don't, I mean, you know, I'm just not ever having that time in my life where I didn't have the church or have faith. So that's, that's an interesting perspective to have. And I think that does, like you said, help you to be a lot more in tune with that. And the reality is that we've got so many people now that are coming to church for the first time who've never had that experience. And so 
I think how we talk and how we, you know, maybe not use so many churchy words, um, but exactly like you said, try to explain it more. I think that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'd even have to explain to my worship leaders um, while I was training them to say, never assume mm-hmm. anything right. in the room. That That is if we really want to reach people that don't know mm-hmm, God, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Like, don't assume people know these songs. Right. Don't assume that people know why we stand or why we raise our hands or why we pray. And so, so many times, even in worship leading training, I would say, you know, you know or, or even as I was, sometimes when I lead worship on stage, I'll tell people, you know, sometimes you can raise your hand and it's not like, either uber spiritual or Mm -hmm. spooky spiritual. It's not that it's a response. So really having to explain (laughs) that. um, And I used to have people sometimes be like, why do you have to do that all the time? Mm -hmm. But again, if you grow up in church, you lose the perspective um, that people don't understand. It's kind of like the first time I ever went to a Catholic mass. Right. (laughs) And I was like, what in the world? You know, I mean, because it wasn't my come from, you know, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, read this, read that. But nobody ever explained exactly. what it is, why, you know, why it was happening or invited me into the process, so to speak, you know, being yeah. someone that's not part of that tradition. So um, I think there's a real opportunity, uh, really, for worship leaders to remember to stay engaged and always remember what it feels like to feel like on the outside of something that there are people in churches all over the place that that's how they feel. Um, and it's just good for us to keep remembering that. Absolutely. That's so good. So good. All right. On to the second question, Mm -hmm. which was you do so much writing and speaking about multiculturalism and relationships between cultures. How do you think the church as a whole is doing overall with connecting cultures together? Overall, we're doing awful. Agreed. (laughs) Which is, which takes a lot for me to say, because I'm a, you know, I don't know if you're an Enneagram person, I'm a seven. So which means I'm always like, woo, where's the party, right? Right. Um, And this is the work I do. So let me say this, we're doing awful, but, but, very important, but, but I do believe that um, particularly monocultural churches are starting to explore this more than they ever have. Mm-hmm. So I'll say that. I think oh, we are absolutely. on the front end of um, diving into the multicultural church. I mean, um, you know, there's still very few churches that are, um, I'm not even use use the word multicultural. Mm-hmm. I'm going to use the word uh, racially integrated. I mean, like when you say it like sense. that, yeah. it's kind of like, because you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. But even just racially integrated, there's still very few. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, obviously. But um, I think we we have done a poor job, I think because we have forgotten what it is that is inside of us and what we carry. Um, you know, Jesus is the unifier. Mm. And if the spirit of Christ lives in us, then that unifying spirit is with, within us. And I think, this is, again, it's my opinion. Um, I think that we've just been distracted by things that really in, in the large sense, large sense of the world don't matter uh, for communities of faith. Mm-hmm. And um, I think we've, we have um, developed a model of doing church sometimes that mm. has put a lot on the line for us in order to make change that I don't think God ever intended the church to bear. Um, and so we, we are slow and scared to make change. Um, so there, there's a lot at play, um, but I'm definitely looking forward to the church getting its credibility back. You know, I, I want to, I look forward to hopefully five, six years from now where, you know, our, an unbelieving world is calling the church to mm-hmm. say, Hey, you guys have figured this out. How do we, what do we do here? How do we figure yeah, this out? Yeah. How do we, you know, but we can't do that while we're still, you know, an unbelieving world at times is more diverse than we are. Mm-hmm. And um, that makes me mad. And I hope it makes Christian people mad all over the place, yeah. you know, because unity is what, what Jesus has asked of us. So, um, 
so yeah, so we're not doing great, but I do believe that there is an awakening that is happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I think back to my, you know, I obviously wasn't around when it happened, but my grandparents were longtime members of a church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that in the 60s, the neighborhood started to change. Mm -hmm. Actually, my grandparents ended up moving out, uh, but it ended up to the point where the, the church itself didn't connect with the community around it. You know, like I said, my grandparents moved away, but they still went back every Sunday morning for worship. But it got yeah. to the point then in about the 80s and 90s where the church essentially died because mm -hmm. it, it just didn't reach people where they were. And, and, and especially in that multicultural way, because it was, you know, it was that kind of thing that just you, you lose out on that. You know, and I mean, I'm here in Houston where it is one of the most multicultural cities in the United States. Yes. And, and, and so really by nature, in a lot of ways, we, we end up having to be. Now, yeah, you go to my church on Sunday morning, a majority of the people are white, but that's not always the case. There are some other colors, which is awesome to see and it's exciting to see. But, you know, we, as a church, we haven't really leaned into that of how do we connect to, you know, whether it's the Hispanic culture. I mean, we, again, we have a, another congregation that's part of our congregation that worships in Spanish, but we don't do much to link the two together. Right. You know, and, and that's, that's the, the frustrating part. It's like, well, okay, they have their thing and we have our thing, but it should be an us all together thing. Well, and, and, and what you say is true. And, mm -hmm. and I'm telling you that the reason so much of this does not happen is because everybody is afraid to lose. Mm -hmm. um, people are yeah. afraid to lose what they've known. Uh, people are afraid to give up their preferences because at some level, mm -hmm. you know, church has sort of become about what we all prefer. Mm -hmm. you know and oh, i'm not sure there's biblical basis for that um that that's what the church should be around and there's even principles i'm sure you know that for years i mean the church planting models have been i mean they even at least they call it what it is homogeneous church principle yep. you know like if that's not the worst thing that's ever happened to the exactly. church i don't know what is because the goal then is you know that goal is great here's here's a fast way to build a church Right. And that works. Yeah. But that's not the goal. I mean, I'm building a multicultural church. Trust me, it's the slowest way to grow a church. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. But it is, I think, very much in line with um, the model that we see in scripture. And so I think that particularly for majority white culture, yeah. um, the tricky part is that because white Americans are the majority in our in our culture, their culture is seen as quote unquote normal. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, you know, white Americans don't like in my workshops, I'll ask how many of you feel like an ethnic group? And a lot of people, like, they don't even think about that. Like, wait a minute, but other people are ethnicities, not us, but like white Americans are an ethnic group. And so to then look at how you do things in a church or leadership or that kind of thing mm -hmm. through the eyes of, we're an ethnic group rather than like, absolutely. If this is what's quote unquote normal is a big leap. Um, and f I think for a lot of people, particularly a lot of white Americans, um, it takes some time to make that shift. Um, only because, you know, uh, people have had the luxury I would say of being the majority now, and you can be the majority wherever. I'm not just saying about white Americans, like, you know, I'm in the majority because I speak English. Right. You know, so uh, there are blind spots I have because I'm an English speaker mm -hmm. that, you know, I need to learn and so on and so forth. So yeah. it's just, uh, there's a lot of dynamics at play um, that can be changed and can be, um, you know, poked and shifted. But we first have to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 exactly it. And I think a lot of it comes down to comfort, you know, like you, you kind of touched on that of just, you know, we're, we're not wanting to give up anything or lose, but I think it, it really comes down to, we've become comfortable in the oh, church. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, know, you think about 
like you know we we joke about in, in in our in my church that you know if we take away the coffee and donuts between the services Ooh. on Sunday morning oh there'd be a riot right but that's comfort right it's what we come to expect and mm-hmm. it's I mean anything like that whether it's the music or how we worship or all those things it comes down to being comfortable and when you're uncomfortable that can lead to some good things but it's that initial oh wait you're taking this away and i don't know if i like that so yeah i mean i think that that's a really important thing to keep in mind yeah and and i mean think about it look we we can be comfortable everywhere Mm -hmm. um we can be comfortable at home we can be comfortable in the car we can there's lots of choices we can make um almost everywhere in our life particularly here in the united states that make us comfortable and the the thing is is that if we can remember that (laughs) that Mm -hmm. when we go to church and even when we worship together it's about us it's no longer about the individual it can't be um it has Mm -hmm. to be about the Mm usness of worship and so how would that change a community when the community shows up to the gathering of the saints open-handed knowing that like any, you know, we're ready to yep. give up whatever it is for the sake of the greater us that's happening. And then, you know, if, I mean, think about that as worship leaders. I mean, if you, if you, you don't have to like every song, you can still worship God. Mm-hmm. You don't have to like every song, right? Because when you get in your car, thank God for iTunes, right? Get in your car, <laughs> you can put on whatever playlist you want mm-hmm. when you're by yourself, yes. right? Or with people that like what you like that's fine. Go ahead and do that in your car. But when we come together as the people of God, it's about us. And I think, um, gosh, there's so much ahead of us. If we could just remember that, um, that the gathering of the saints is about the larger, the larger narrative of the diverse body of Christ. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, it goes back to even in Genesis and creation, right? You know, it's, in the image of God, he made them male and female. He made them well. Okay. So we're all made in God's image. We all don't look the same, you know, and so we're all uniquely created, but we're all in the image of God. And so that's been one of the things I've tried to focus myself on. And and that was just how I was raised and taught is that you look at people as children of God, creations of God, loved by him, redeemed by him. And when you, when you put it in that focus, and I, I, I don't do it as perfectly as I always should, of course, but when you think about it in that context, that makes it so much easier to connect to people, to relate to people and love them. Because I mean, I, I look at you and you're a child of God. That's it. <laughs> you know, I don't look at you as anything else but that. And, right. and, that, and that shapes, and, and I think, again, it goes back to we in the church just kind of lose sight of that for whatever reason and i I don't understand it but we do it's like we have amnesia yeah you know um i think about the that scripture in revelation where it Mm -hmm. talks about believers in the end times and it says that they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony Mm -hmm. and that is the part that uh i feel like we've lost a little bit we're losing. I would say we lost it. We're mm-hmm. losing it mm-hmm. just because we're distracted by so many of the things that um, may not, I mean, it may matter to us, but may not matter to God um, yeah. in, in this day and time. Because I honestly, I feel like everybody's afraid to die. Everybody's afraid of losing an identity. I mean, take, take race and ethnic culture out of it. I mean, mm-hmm. think about how we talk about age in the church, Right. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody can identify with that. I mean, think about how we talk about young people and how we talk about older people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just we essentially, even as leaders, we, the, our language makes the divide wider and wider and wider and wider and wider, right? Between oh, these, these people where it's like the older people in the church are saying, is there any place for me because I'm old? or older and the young people are saying, is there any place for me? Cause I'm younger. Like we shouldn't be having that conversation. And the answer is yes. <laughs> there Correct. <it> is. <laughs> right. But, but we have, we're so, this is a whole nother podcast, but mm-hmm. I'll just say we, I actually think we are so used to our separatist history. Um, even in church circles 
-hmm. that uh, it's just what we know is separate. Yeah. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know yet how much that influences what we do now, but, um, you know, we have a language of division, even within the church, mm-hmm. um, particularly see it around age, um, but certainly around ethnic culture as well. And I think we, we really need to become more aware um, as yeah. church leaders about how we're talking about what it is that we're trying to do as a church um, and what matters. Um, Cause I think we're, we're uh, pushing people out on the margins and then wondering why people aren't coming to church. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think sometimes it could be as simple as what is the language of the church? What is the language of the leaders? Yeah. Um, just being aware of that. No, that's, that's beautifully said. All right. Onto the third question. Uh, for many of us who are predominantly <laughs> one culture in our congregations, how do we start to expand understanding and connection to other cultures through music in our congregations? Mm. Oh, I love this question so much. Mm-hmm. So, gosh, where to start? There's so many things to say. All right. So number one. Well, you got plenty of time. <laughs> okay. So number one is we overall in creative church ministries, music, art, dance, whatever it is, tech, um, we have lost our permission to be ourselves. Um, the industry, the Christian industry, um, and I'll throw in music, books, you know, famous preachers, whatever the heck that is, um, you know, just stuff like that. It has so influenced the church that the local church now, um, for the most part, doesn't always feel like it has permission to do what it feels God wants it to do. And that's why you could go and visit five different churches on the same street and hear all five of the same songs. I, I'm concerned by that because I'm like, these are five different communities, faith communities. Why am I hearing the five same songs in every single one done the, the exact same way with the exact same instrumentation with the yes. exact same leadership style? Yes. I'm concerned about that because what, what, we do sometimes, and I think we, we just, like I said, we just lost permission. We do sometimes is to say, okay, you know, what, what's hot this quarter? You know, and it changes every quarter, right? Or, mm-hmm. okay, I need, a, I need a worship set. Let me go look on CCLI. Yep. Ain't nothing wrong with CCLI, let me be clear, right? Nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing. If you're, A, if you're trying to be a diverse con- congregation, that's a problem. B, If you don't care about being a diverse congregation, but you just want to connect with yours, whatever that is, you have to know that the the resources, the Christian resources, is actually more segregation of people. And um, so as a musician, it's dangerous to keep looking to other people to take your own cues. I mean, you can look at other people's work, sure, mm-hmm. right? Like as a guide or to appreciate something. But what I feel like what we are doing, particularly in worship communities at churches, is we are literally just stealing other people's identities and making it our own and saying, well, this is what's relevant. This is what's hot. And because it's relevant and hot, that's what God blesses. Mm-hmm. When it's really like, no, maybe that's just what makes money. I don't know. I'm just poking, right? Yeah. Um, for a church, like I'm, I desperately want a church to find its own identity and to find its own sound, you know, cause, cause too, we're kind of killing ministry people sometimes too. Cause we're like, Hey, we need to sound like, you know, fill in the blank band. And they've got six electric guitar players, two keyboardists and five drummers. And you got an organ player and a didgeridoo player, you know, and you're like, how mm-hmm. come we don't sound like that? Well, because that's not who you are. You're stealing right. somebody else's right. identity. Right. So I actually think that's a, that's a big issue um, with, particularly with music communities. Um, so I would say the first thing is, is to <laughs> be really aware of what we're, you're being fed. Because what you, ten, nine times out of 10, what you are being fed will not lead you towards the goal that you are trying to accomplish mm-hmm. in your own local church particularly if it's a multicultural vision, because 
even our resources now, you know, CCM is code for white rock music. And I'm kind of like, well, at least black gospel says what it is. It's black gospel. Right. It's black gospel, right? So they're over here. So you have this huge, and then you're kind of like, well, here are our options, right? But what about all the other cultures in the middle? Mm -hmm. And so then what happens is, this is why the diverse church is so important, Greg, mm -hmm. because if we're not, what, what's, what's being created is, uh, it, tur it turns from, hey, that's really cool from that culture to this is what God blesses. And that's when it's a problem. So really looking at how you do what you do as a way, not necessarily the right way. Mm -hmm. Really important mindset to have. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And once you I get love that, that answer. I think that's, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's mm -hmm. the important way to look at it. It is a way. It's not mm -hmm. the way. It's not the right way. It's not the wrong way. Not the it's wrong way. A way. Just a way. It's a way. And I think a lot of times you're right. We get caught up in that of, well, it's got to be just like this. Um, I'll, I'll never forget. I actually wrote a blog post about it on Thursday of um, using the instruments that you have, right? Of trying yes. not to sound like something. Well, my first church that I was, was full time at, I was also the youth director. So mm. we had our worship band was me playing keyboard. Our pastor played trumpet. I had a saxophone player, a trombone player, a clarinet player, and a couple singers. That mm. was our, an acoustic guitar. And that was our band. But it was wonderful because we used the abilities that were there. Yes. And put it together. Now, yeah, it challenged me creatively because I had to write out parts for everybody. But it was a labor of love because it gave them an opportunity to use those gifts in worship where they may not have been able to on a regular basis. Yeah, and that's when you get to the point as a worship pastor or worship director, worship leader, whatever your role is, that you love people more than you love songs. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, I think we're in this space in some churches where we love the song so much mm -hmm. that it's like we will do the song at the expense of people in our ministry. You know, what if your people can't pull it off? Right. Um, or like, we're, we're trying to make people into something that they're not. Um, and then yeah. saying it's their fault. Mm -hmm. And really as a leader, if you, like you're saying, look at what do I have in front of me? Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. And so how can we do what we are supposed to do and sound like us, you know, in its most authentic form mm -hmm. <clears throat> rather than again, stealing, we are stealing identities, Craig. We're stealing identities mm -hmm. from people at church. You know, it's funny. I have a, I have a friend <clears throat> in Australia who uh, attends Hillsong mm -hmm. and she was actually part of the, that movement, like the very early movement. She was one of the songwriters at like 15 or something. Right. And she would tell me all the time. She says, it's really funny for people who go to Hillsong. She's like, people forget that we're a church. Like we're actually a worshiping community. Mm -hmm. And these songs came out of our experience as a community. Right. And initially, now I mean, now it's a global brand, right? But she said, initially, we were singing songs for our community that we needed. So she said, it, it's kind, it was kind of weird for then like other people to start mm -hmm. singing their songs because they're like, yeah, but we just wrote this song because this happened in our church, you right. know? Right. We need to get back to that, you know? I was, I was joking. I was teaching this work, workshop at uh, Cedarville University a couple weeks ago. And I was joking with people because I said, look, if you find your worship set by just looking at the top CCLI Hot 5 100 or whatever, I said, let's say you live in Oklahoma and you all just went through a barrage of tornadoes and floods. I said, please don't be singing the number one song that sings about tornadoes and floods and God your loves like a tornado. Like, don't do that. Like, right? Because that's, that would be the worst thing ever right. because you're not singing for your community. Mm -hmm. right like at that point you're not even being aware as a leader that like okay when you sing god i want you to love me like a flood which first of all no thank you 
right? <laughs> Floods are damaging and yes. so are hurricanes and yes, fires. Are. I don't want any part of it, right? I'll just take the traditional love that God gives me, like right. I'm good, right? <laughs> but like if you're gonna sing about God, your love's like a flood just cause it's hot right now. And you know, three people in your congregation just had their house flooded because of the, don't sing that. But that, but that's what happens sometimes. That's just a small thing mm-hmm. when we're not, we don't have an awareness as leaders, and not only an awareness, Craig, but also we haven't defined what are we trying to accomplish because we just go looking for it at everybody else's place. Mm-hmm. We always have to know, you know, our, our music ministries and worship ministries, it should have its own mission, vision, values that is connected to the greater vision of the house, right? The exactly. larger church. Yep. But we should always know what is it that we're trying to create, mm-hmm. you know, given who we have and what, where the church is going and what's going on. And then we pull from some resources from industry if we need to. Um, somehow or another, we, I would love to see that flipped. Yeah, um, I'm right there you know, with where you. They, yeah, industry is just a support and not the driving force of, how we do worship in the church. Yeah, uh, that's, that's great. That is fantastic. Um, okay, on to the fourth question, because this is yeah. about you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're a songwriter and a worship leader. So what's the, what's the song that you've written that's had the most impact on you? <laughs> yeah. So um, <clears throat> there's a song that, is on a, a record of mine called Longings. Mm-hmm. And the song is called Plea. And I actually wrote this song about a friend who I unintentionally hurt. So the story is very shortly. When I was a new leader at church, I had a friend who I had been friends with them, this couple, like for years. They'd known me at another church, like for years. And the husband, they were older than me, the husband started developing early onset uh, Alzheimer's. Mm. I think he was like in his like 50 or something, mm. early 50s. Wow. So anyway, he played, um, uh, he's one of the instrumentalists at our church. And it started to get really hard. You know, I mean, essentially we do rehearsal and we show up on Sunday and it was literally like he was never there, mm. you know, cause he was struggling. And so everything started to kind of revolve around this gentleman. And so I made the decision that it was time um, for him to step down. And again, young leader, never led a thing in my life, right? Right. right. <clears throat> and I talked to my friend and basically was like, hey, it's time um, for him to step down. And the mistake I made, I would still make the same decision. But how that, how that walked itself out, I would have changed if I would have known. Mm-hmm. And I tell young leaders this all the time, which is, um, you know, when you, so like that decision, I had marinated on that for about six months. And then I was ready to make the decision. And then when you make the decision, you just make it, right? And you don't realize that oftentimes your people are still six months where you were. Right. Right? And so you have to pause and go backwards, right? Mm -hmm. What I should have done was laid out, okay, over the next three or four months, this is what needs to happen, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Instead, it felt like a firing right? without any warning. And I'll never forget the last thing that my friend, the husband, ever said was, I don't need to speak to you ever again. Mm. And he left out of the church. And that was the song, <laughs> Plea. Wow. that I wrote because we hadn't been speaking mm-hmm. and I was devastated because I thought I was doing the right thing. Right. Like I just didn't know. And so I wrote this song and every time I would sing it live, it was just like, ugh, you know, and I'd share the story <laughs> and, and all that. And again, make a long story short, thankfully uh, we're speaking again. Good. Um, the, my friend, the husband is still, is not well. Mm. but uh, his wife and I still talk. So Good. that's probably been the most meaningful song. One of the most meaningful songs I've ever written. It was the first mm-hmm. thing that came to my head. Good. All right. So the last question, and I love your answer to this last question. Like, <laughs> um, 
What do you want to say to an audience of church musicians? Oh boy. All right. Three things. One is uh, love the people of God more than you love songs. Please. I beg you. Um, please love people and please stay human. Uh, when you are leading, um, I, I teach in enough colleges too now that I see it. We are, we are um, training a group of worship leaders that will never speak to the church because they're letting the songs lead the worship. Um, and if that's the case, why do they need you? You know, if there's tracks and Ableton Lady and, and that's all they ever get to speak, like, they don't need you. Just play a recording. It's probably going to be better anyway. I mean, let's keep yep. it real, right? I say that all the time. <laughs> I know. So, like, love people. Love your congregation. Be pastoral. Be prophetic. Um, love them more than you love songs and platform. Because uh, ain't nobody got time for that in the church, honestly. Um, the work we do is about people. So that's the first thing I would say. Second thing I would say is, I alluded to it earlier, is um, pursue being a creationist, not a copyist. Um, we desperately need to reclaim this, desperately. You know, write your own songs. Write your own curriculum. Um, if something doesn't exist and you need it for your church and your community, you write it. You know, find somebody else in your community to write it create things and then consume something. Um, but I think we kind of find our life again and find our creativity again mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when we start creating things, you know? I mean, Bethel people, Hillsong people, hymn writers, whoever, they're not the only people that can write songs. Right. I mean, they're just not. Um, so yes, so pursue being a creationist, <laughs> not a copyist. Um, we need to get rid of that. And then the third thing is I would say, please pursue building the multicultural church and community. I'm telling you right now, for anybody listening, that it is one of a handful of things that I believe you don't even need to pray about. You don't need to pray, God, should we be diverse? <laughs> no, let me fast. Let's fast for 40 days. No, eat the burger. Go eat. Go ahead and eat. And pray for Sister Mildred, who is having surgery. Like, do that instead, because it's a better way, the better, um, a better use of your time than praying about whether you should be diverse. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus is so clear in John 17 about unity among the believers. And he says, John 17, that is actually when an unbelieving world will know that he loves them. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, when the the church building is sexy and big. It's not when the, you know, the children's ministry is banging. Like those things matter. But he says, no, this is evangelism. When y'all, because <laughs> that's how Jesus spoke back then. Of course. Because um, y'all, <laughs> when y'all are one, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. here's the deal. This is how I feel about it. The multicultural church, particularly in America, is going to happen whether we want it or not right? Because people are coming and they're already here. Yeah. And so I'm like, let's get in front of it and stop being reactive like we are to everything else um, and being 15 years behind. Let's not be 15 years behind. Like, Don't let Microsoft and Apple's workforce look more diverse than yours because their goal is money. Ours isn't. Right. Right. Right? We have a bigger goal. So that's why I'm, that's why I'm so passionate about it is it's coming. Don't be caught off guard. Um, and it is the multicultural church is one of the only reasons that me and my husband have some place to worship. So, you know, there are lots of people like us yeah. who end up not going to church because somebody has to check their culture at the door. Always, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. your interracial couples, your biracial people, um, you know, we call them like peanut butter caramel children, you know, people that yeah, look like yeah, us yeah. and have kids, you know, yeah, yeah. like those kids, they need to be in Sunday school and not have to worry about answering the question, what are you? Absolutely. They need to learn about Jesus. Um, but those are things that um, if, if churches stay monocultural, it's dangerous. It's actually, we lose perspective. We're already seeing it. Mm -hmm. We're already seeing it across 
all kinds of things, social, socioeconomic issues, social issues, political issues. We just can't talk to each other because we're in these little siloed monocultural spaces. And that's for everybody, by the way. It's not just like white Americans. That's everybody. That Everybody's responsible. So that's what I would say. I would beg church leaders to learn, get some training, um, read some books, uh, have, spend the money in your budget to have consultants come in and get a coach, like all of that. Mm-hmm. We must do it. We must do it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Nikki. I'm so glad you took the time to join us. And uh, welcome. we really appreciate it. Thank you, Craig.